SJC News, St. John Church News. Here's your anchor, Sandra Dorsey. We, the members, family, and friends of St. John AME Church, Columbus, Georgia, would like to say congratulations, Reverend Dr. Richard Allen Washington Sr. for successfully defending and completing your doctoral dissertation. We are so very proud of you. To God be the glory. We want to also wish you a happy birthday, Pastor Washington. We pray that this Tuesday, April the 27th, will be extraordinarily special to you, full of joy for you, and that God will grant every one of your wishes. St. John, let's finish April strong in our stewardship. God says to give, and it will be given back to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap, for with the measure you use it will be measured back to you. Trust God with your tithe. Be sure to join Pastor Washington each Monday and Friday morning at 7 a.m. for prayer and devotion. Through God's word, we learn that your house is only as strong as the foundation is built upon and that the sure foundation of God's word and prayer will stand. On behalf of Pastor Washington, I say, thank you, St. John, for your support at the Eastern District Planning Meeting on yesterday. Your confidence in and dedication to our ministry was shown, and for that, Pastor is grateful. This concludes today's edition of SJC News. Be informed, stay connected, and spread the word. Now here's Donya Albright. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Greetings, St. John family, and welcome to today's virtual worship experience. Please be reminded that members of the finance team will be here today from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. to receive your tithes and offerings. You may also take advantage of use of our cash app. Please be reminded that God loves a cheerful giver. And now let us be blessed with a word from our pastor, Reverend Washington. Good morning and welcome to our virtual worship experience for April the 25th, 2021. I am Pastor Richard Allen Washington and I am so grateful to join you this exciting, electrifying Sunday. This is a day the Lord has made and I am rejoicing and I'm so glad in it. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule, your Sunday, where you could serve and do anything and watch anything you wanted. And you have spending a few moments with us. I appreciate your willingness. I appreciate your tuning in. And you know what? I am going to prophetically say it. I appreciate you and your willingness to support this ministry in a way that helps us become even better and even more faithful to the kingdom of God. Thank you so very much. As you know, April is a tremendous month. It's a tremendous month to serve God through serving others. And I'm praying that as we extend our opportunities to serve in unique ways, that you will join us this month, the rest of it and in May. It's almost over for April, but May is on the way and great things are in store. Let me thank the St. John family this morning. Let me thank you for your support. Let me thank you for your kindness. And let me ultimately thank you for the way you have encouraged your pastor over the last three years. Uh, on this past Friday, I was oh, taking a moment to thank God after having defended uh, the dissertation project that I was presenting uh, to earn the doctorate degree that I was seeking. And I want St. John to know that it was not done without your love, your support, and St. John, your patience. Thank you for your willingness to just be patient in these three years, particularly in this last year of COVID, how you have supported your pastor. And I am so eternally grateful and I love you. And I could not have done this without you. And I'm so thankful. This is as much yours as it is mine. Thank you. Today, it's a pleasure to bring to you the word of God for the people of God. In the first gospel written, 
That's right, Mark, you know it's one of my favorites. The Lord, our God, calls our attention. While we are in the season of resurrection, and we know that Christ was raised from the dead by God's power to serve a greater community, today I wanna pull us back to the very first miracle in the first gospel recorded on paper, Mark. I'd like to invite you to Mark chapter one and a few verses to see how God is willing to use the word of God to bless us with what we stand in the need of. So let's go to work. Mark chapter one, verse 29 is where we will find our footing. And today I'm sharing from the English translation of this text, the English translation, the English version of the text is what I wanna share with you from and listen to God speak to you, listen to God speak to me, and let's have a great experience together. Let's have a koinonia experience as we hear God speak to us. Are you ready? Let's go to work. Mark chapter one, verse 29 through 31. Listen for the word of God. And immediately Jesus left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and with John. Now, Simon's mother-in-law lay sick and ill with a fever, and immediately they told Jesus about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. Amen. Our subject for this morning is simple. Speaking to the soul, the power of our touch speaking to the soul, the power of our touch. This is an extraordinary experience that we walk into in the Gospel of Mark. For years, those who have been kind enough and patient enough to hear me preach from the Gospel of Mark, understand that Mark is really a gospel that is written to people who are on the fringes of society. For any of us who are engaged in life and feel pushed to the edge this gospel is for us. Mark is that gospel that speaks to any area of your life where you are at the edge of it. It could be your health, where you have reached a point where there is no return. You have gone too far into the search for a cure and you are too far from the cure to turn around. You are at the edge, the fringe, the margin of your experience. For those who are dealing with a sense of bankruptcy financially, you're on the edge of all that life has for you. You are living beyond paycheck to paycheck. You are living day to day. And you are at the point where you are not certain how the day will end or if you're going to make it. This is for you. For those who are emotionally at your wit's end, this gospel is for you. Particularly this story is for you. If you are emotionally at the edge, but also intellectually at the edge, overwhelmed with thinking about the many different challenges and decisions that you have to make. And let me pause and say an intellectual kickstand here that often we are indecisive about things when we have made decisions in our past that we are no longer proud of and that we're afraid we can't do again. But I want to encourage you today that anytime you make a decision and you've prayed about it, then God's in charge of that decision. And you've got to trust God in your faith to handle what you may have messed up in the past. Now, back to the text. Mark is that gospel that speaks to the overwhelmed people intellectually, emotionally, and can I be honest, the people who are overwhelmed socially, where you have just exhausted yourself to the point where you are tired of engaging with people. Yes, Mark speaks to you. Let me pause and let me say it this way. Mark speaks to a community of people who are absolutely exhausted, but yet called to keep going. You are exhausted, but you're called to keep going. Do I have any witnesses out there that know that you are exhausted, that you have done everything you could? Fact is, COVID has been around for over a year and here you stand exhausted and don't know how it's going to look in another week or two. Mark has a word for you, particularly in this, the 29th verse through the 31st verse. Here what God does with a man named Jesus, we come to know as the savior of the world. Let me, let me set this up for you. 
Mark sets Jesus up for this meaning and this message. Jesus is coming to bring the kingdom of God to everyone. Jesus is coming to interrupt the intellectuals who want to exclude everybody. Jesus is coming to interrupt the political games who don't want to include all of God's people. Let me share with you, family, at some moment in our life, maybe now more than ever, there's a group that you desire to be a part of, but they have excluded you and they don't have, watch this, an interest in seeing you come home to it. There are people in this world who actually don't want you to have any more than you have now. They don't want you to have any more access to God. They don't want you to have any more access to blessings. They don't want you to have any more access to the abundant life that God has promised those who believe in him. This is for you. Jesus comes in Mark's gospel to give you what other people said you can't have, to give you what other people don't want you to have, to give you and to give me the promise, the purpose, and the power that only a few elitists want to hold on their own. This is what Jesus comes for in the Gospel of Mark. And that shouts me to know that in spite of those who don't want you or me to have it, Mark declares his Jesus says it's yours. And I'm so grateful that the Lord our God loves all of us enough to give us what other folks say we can't have, don't deserve, and have no understanding of how to handle. Isn't it awesome that God would bless you and that God would bless me with the abundant life and that's what Jesus has come for. He's come to give you life and more abundantly and I promise you he can do more for you in heaven now than he could for those who were on earth with him. I'm grateful for the resurrection because Jesus has done more in his resurrection than he did in his living life on earth for me and for you. God, thank you for his resurrection. In his resurrection, I was saved. In his resurrection, I was set free. In his resurrection, I found that you love me and would go through great lengths just to prove your love to me. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. The text says that Jesus has just left church and was entering into the home for a good home cooked meal. Have mercy. A good home cooked meal in the house of Simon and his brother Andrew. And brothers and sisters, you have to ask this question because you've missed it. Every time you've heard this sermon preached by this text or, or even studied this in scripture, I promise you've looked over it. Most of us don't consider that the text says that the house belonged to Peter, Simon Peter, and Andrew. That means that both of them own the property. And that's a miracle in itself that there are two brothers who can own property together and they're not fighting over it. They're not at odds about it. They live, watch this, under the same roof. Now, some of us, if we're honest, struggle to live under the same roof with a husband, a wife, or children, or by ourselves. And here the Bible tells us in chapter one of Mark that two families are existing under the same roof must be a hell of a house must be a gargantuan house must be a house so big that they live on the opposite sides I don't know I'm not privileged to know exactly how large it is but I am certain that at least two families lived under the same roof and they were not at odds let me pause and invite you to look at your life and to tell the truth about your life we can do better loving accepting and appreciating and valuing the people we live with at this very moment. No, you don't have to live like they live. No, you don't have to agree with everything they do. No, they may not own the home as much as you do, but under the same roof, you can get along. Under the same roof, you can find grace. Under the same roof, you can extend mercy. Under the same roof, you can extend joy and peace. Two men had two different families living under the same roof. And here, my brothers and sisters, is what speaks to the soul under the same roof, and yet they are in one accord in harmony. Beloved, the text says that they were under the same roof. And here is the challenge in the text, under the same roof, but Peter's mother-in-law has fallen ill to the point where she has, in some versions, a fever. Your version may not say fever. Mine 
says fevers in some of the translations. But let me be clear. The clear part of this is that she was ill to the point where her fever had made her so sick that she had to lay down. Let me pause. The word says that immediately Jesus learned about it and he went to her. Don't miss that the word immediately indicates it was so severe that there was no time that Jesus wasted. He got to her immediately. And when he gets to her, I want you to understand what he does. Speaking to the soul, he does something that really is important that we catch. Fever at this moment in time was valuable and important to understand. But before we get to the fever of Simon's mother-in-law, I want you to understand that she is not given a name by the writer. And some of us in this age of womanism, and some of us, some of us in the year of the woman, according to the television and the media screen, this is supposed to be the year of the woman. Some of us would struggle with the fact that this woman does not have a name outside of who she is attached to, and that's her son-in-law. She is known as Peter's mother-in-law. No name. We don't know if it was Betty, if it was Susie. We don't know if it was Connie. We don't know if it was Jameson. We have no idea what her name, but what we understand is who she's related to. This text can be considered chauvinistic if you are that small minded. Let me let me say it differently. It's hard to be big when little got you. I'm going to say that because somebody needs to hear it. It's hard to be big when little got you. Some of us want to be big, but little got us. And if you are caught up on the fact that this woman doesn't have a name, and I'm speaking just not about this woman, some of us need to understand just because you are not included in some things that people want to exclude you from, don't get caught in the smallness of them excluding you. Get caught in the fact that God can make you big without somebody excluding you. Woo! Somebody needs to hear. This is what the kingdom of God is about. For those who would exclude you, God can use your exclusion to include you and his glory. And I'll be honest, I don't know anybody that cares to be excluded from a club or a group here on earth when God has included you in his plan for eternal life. I would rather be excluded by any person on this earth and have God include me and in God's divine plan for life and watch God's elevation of you because you're included in God's plan and excluded from man. Let them exclude you, honey. God has already included you. And God says what I have included is for you to be elevated when others have ex excluded you. Is there anybody that's grateful that God can touch you by including you when you have been excluded by people around you? I'll shout for you because there are some moments where your job will exclude you. Some moments where your church will exclude you. Some moments where your family will exclude you. Some moments where your friends, your spouses, your children will exclude you. But God loves you so much that he will include you in his plan and elevate you in a way that everybody who's excluded you has to come watch you. The text testifies that the exclusion part is important for you to understand. I did all of that to bring you to this point. Text says that Simon's mother-in-law has a fever and you need to understand that fever in this period of time would mean that others were excluded from her. You, you, you don't know, fever at this time meant that people could not be around you because watch this, they were afraid that whatever you had, they could catch it. And so they excluded her. She's in a room by herself. They set her up to be sick alone. And can I testify that there are some times in life where the illnesses that you have, whether it's mental, emotional, intellectual, or social, will exclude people from wanting to deal with you. There's an illness and a fever that can be produced by the sin in our life. 
where people will exclude us because of what we've done or what we have not done. I'm a witness. People will exclude you based on what they think you have done or you're going to do. Is there a witness who has been excluded not because of who you are at your core, but because of what somebody heard or what somebody thinks they have excluded you about? I promise you, you hadn't lived and you hadn't loved until somebody has excluded you based on what they thought they knew about you. Text says she's excluded because of fever and we don't even know her name, but here is the point. There's so much meat in here, I'm gonna have fun. The point is this, we aren't given a name and it's hard to be big when little has you. Here's the point. Some of us wanna be included in everything instead of being excluded by some so God can include you in his plan. And when you do struggle with being excluded by little people, you are little and you miss the big thing that God may be doing in your life so that you're clear on that. This woman is excluded because she has a fever and people don't wanna be around her. And that part is tied to the explanation that sometimes our conditions make people wanna exclude us. Fever has excluded her. I'm just explaining so you don't think I'm lost. I know what I'm doing, you gotta follow. So that she is excluded from people, but she's never excluded from God. That's why Jesus comes to show, watch this, here's the key. Her name is not as important as what God is going to do for her. Here's the key, because what she represents is everybody who's ever been ill with a fever or a sickness that has excluded you. Come here for a minute, you missed it. That's the HIV, that's the AIDS, that's the COVID-19, that's the person with hypertension that's been excluded from eating some of the things that you shouldn't eat. That's the person with diabetes. That's the person with heart disease. That's the person with cancer that's been excluded because of how cancer has affected your body. That's the person with cataracts. That's the person with glaucoma. That's the person who suffered any health ailment or emotional ailment or mental ailment where people have excluded you based on the type of illness, fever that you have. And can I take a moment to let you know that Jesus Christ has come to this house with a woman who is ill and has a fever and has not left. His ability to touch the soul comes from his ability to do this very thing. I ain't there yet, I'm gonna have fun with this. He is present and her name is not mentioned because what we have to understand is we can never limit God to just one person. God doesn't include the name because she represents everybody who's had an illness. Never be so small in your own understanding of where you are in your life that because your name is not lifted and mentioned in the plan that you think God isn't able to find you. I told you a couple of weeks ago, it doesn't matter where you are, God knows and can get to you. This woman is sick with a fever. We don't know her name, but Jesus is in the house. Watch this, because he is connected to her son-in-law. Don't miss, sometimes your name isn't as important as the person who can bring God to your situation. Simon brings God through Christ to the situation. Is there anybody grateful that you can have a Simon in your life that God is in relationship with, that you might not have the relationship with God, you should, but because somebody you love and are related to has it, they bring God to your situation. I'm grateful that when I didn't know God for myself, when I didn't know Jesus Christ as a savior, my father and my mother's relationship with God through Christ brought Jesus to see about me. Is there anybody grateful that even though you may not know the right one, that you're connected to somebody else who knows them and they will come see about you and me based on who they know. Woo. Sometimes be grateful for who you know that knows the Lord. The text says, Jesus is in the house 
because of who he knows. And they mentioned to him, she is isolated because she's got a fever. And Jesus, I love this. I, I Wait, before I go further, I got to deal with the fact that he deals with her even though he knows her condition. She's got a fever. Let me share what fever does. And we have to get out of here. Let me share what fever does. Fever is an illness at work. It's, it's an alert, if you will. It lets us know that there's an infection in the body that is so deadly that all of our immune system has rushed to the infected area to battle against the infection. And watch this, they have raised the body's temperature. Our immune system is alerting us that the temperature inside the body has been elevated to fight the battle of the infection or the disease that is at work in us. I said a whole lot to basically say this, the temperature in the circumstance has been elevated to battle the elements that are in the, in the way. You missed it. Sometimes you got to elevate your praise, your prayer life, and your attention to your relationship with God to battle against what's inside of your spiritual life, trying to break you down, break you up, and keep you laid down where you can't move and do what God's gifted you to do. Sometimes I have to raise my prayer level. Sometimes I have to raise my praise level. And sometimes I've had to raise my level of preaching to battle against what was happening in my own life. And sometimes you got to raise your level of relationship with Jesus through prayer, through praise, and yes, through preaching to yourself so that your body is able to battle the infection and the disease that's at work in your life. Maybe it's not a physical disease, and it probably isn't, but it's a spiritual disease that's working on you and got you twisted and tied up in such a way that you have stopped believing in the power of God at work in your circumstance. I've come to tell you, raise your praise. Raise your prayers. Raise your prophetic voice in your own life and watch God come see about you. Her temperature has risen and Jesus is responding to the temp that has been risen and called a fever. And God will respond to our willingness to raise the prayer life, to raise the praise life, to raise our prophetic ability to speak the promises of God to our situation. Let him, you raise your level of praise, praying and speaking prophetically and promises to you and watch Jesus show up. He shows up. I'm finished for today. He shows up. And watch this in him showing up. They say she's ill with fever and he goes directly to her. He actually risked everything because her fever has elevated to his attention. Every now and then, our circumstances can be so rigorous, so rough, and so overwhelming that when we raise our level of praise, when we raise our level of praying, when we raise our, raise our level of prophetically giving the promise of God to our life, the Lord responds to it and shows up and watch this risk being laughed at to see about us. That shouts me because there are some aspects of my life that have been so raggedy and so ratchet. And there are some aspects in your life that have been so ragged and so ratchet that folk have wanted to deal with you. They have not wanted to see about you. They just wanted to leave you alone. But can I be honest? The Lord says, everybody can leave you. I'm just going to show up. And I've come to say that sometimes my best experiences for deliverance have come when everybody left me alone and the Lord shows up. I'm done. That's what you ought to celebrate. Maybe folk had left you alone but I've come to tell you watch God work watch God show up and work in your life when others have excluded when others have walked away God shows up and he shows up when everybody else is gone I really want to go further 
but I got to shut this down. My soul done got happy. And I didn't come today to holler like that. I didn't come today to get happy in my soul. But when I think about the fact that there's so much that we've been excluded from and so much people have judged us on and so much that people have shut us out. And I think about God showing up in our life in spite of it, honey, it shouts me. He will show up when others have excluded. He will show up when others have put you down. He will show up when others have shut you out. The willingness of God to speak to our soul has to do with the power of his touch. First, by showing up. I want you to have a wonderful week. And I want you to trust that God will show up and speak to your soul just like he did the mother-in-law of Peter. We'll be back next week to finish and conclude this. There's so much in it, I couldn't get to it today. Listen, I love you. God loves you. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead for you. And you have a responsibility, family, to live your best life right now. Go live it now. Don't wait, live it now. Have a great day, be encouraged. Let me bless you before we leave. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the face of God shine on you. May the peace of God give you everything you need until I can see you again. I love you. Oh, one more thing. If you would like to join and partner with us to do anything in the ministry and kingdom of God, we welcome you to do so. Let us know. Peace and joy for you. God bless you.